Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today we'll be discussing a case of an elderly female who presented to our ER with complaints of respiratory distress. Can you begin, sir? Yes. There's this one 71 year old female who presented to our ER with complaints of uh, breathing difficulty, but a little more on the history wise, patient had a history of fall about two days prior to the uh, arrival to the ER at, na at around 9 o'clock. Bystanders found her to be lying down on the floor and uh, they picked her up. Everything was like uneventful after that, but the next day onwards she developed breathing difficulty, uh, perhaps related or could be unrelated also, but progressively worsening, which is why they brought her to the ER. Now, in our initial 10 second assessment, patient was a little tachypneic with increased work of breathing, but uh, uh, her sensorium was also a little on a lower side. And then uh, moving on to the primary survey, airway wise, airway was patent as she was able to talk uh, when uh, patient was woken up and uh, no secretions or hoarseness of voice or any facial deformity or external in injuries were seen. And um, breathing wise... You want wise, to rule out uh, seizure? Possibly, sir. Okay. And then uh, breathing wise, she was a little tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 31-32 cycles per minute, maintaining saturation of only about 65% in room air. But air entry was bilaterally equal and there was ronchi heard on auscultation bilaterally and with minimal crepes on the posterior aspect also, the basal areas. And then circulation wise, she had a... Uh, what was the position you gave to the patient when you received the patient? Patient had a little head and elevation. Patient was lying down supine, so but with a little head and elevation. Part of your management as soon as you receive the patient is comfortable position. Position, yes. Sir. And, according to okay. and then our heart rate was around 9800 beats per minute with the circuit, uh, blood pressure of 136 over 90 and all peripheral pulses were palpable. Now disability wise, she was drowsy but arousable, but once she was awake, she was able to obey commands. Pupils were 2.5 bilaterally reactive to light and exposure wise she was afebrile with the uh, GRBS of 182 milligram per deciliter. Now in our primary adjuncts we use we, we did a ABG because patient had a low saturation too. Had, in the meantime we had put the patient on oxygen supplementation and we were trying to uh, but we didn't know the background history of this patient so we took an ABG. See, for this patient how will you manage the oxygen supplementation? Uh, or oxygenation. In this patient, we have to know about the background history also, sir, because let's just say if this patient is a uh, any type 2 respiratory long standing failure patient, controlled oxygen has to be given. Just because saturation is Initially, when the patient is having a saturation of 60 on room air, hmm. you will give controlled oxygenation for above, the such We will maintain at least above 90 will be hmm. our target. Oh, see, the initial step for a, such a hypoxia. Hmm. So, what will you do? How did you manage? This is the practical aspect to your test. Initially, saturation was very low, mm. so you need to aggressively treat that. Mm. You can start on a face mask face or mask. an RBM, like uh, at, uh, maybe at a 10 liter. So, which is a better thing, face mask or an RBM? Initially, we can go for an RBM mm. and later tighten it down. Enough. Yeah, that's short. Mm. See, so initially start with a higher percentage. Where will you get a higher percentage, not an ordinary face mask or? National oh, we have to go for an NRBM, tight fitting mask and positioning of the patient. Okay. Yes, and the airway clearance in case mm -hmm. necessary. If the breathing is not adequate, you have to go for any airway adjunct as well as the manuals. It is also mandatory. Don't forget simple steps. But these are all the basic things we have to institute when the patient is such a grossly hypoxic. Okay. So just simply putting an oxygen mask will not help. Mm. If there is a partial airway obstruction, definitely it will never improve. Mm. It will worsen. Okay. Okay, so, on oxygen, ABG was taken. A patient had a, uh, a respiratory acidosis picture on ABG with a pH of 7.29, PCO2 was 84.4, and PO2 was 138, secondary to the oxygen uh, that we were, the patient sample. was on arterial samples. Uh, and uh, saturation was now maintaining to 99% and bicarbonate was 39.6 but looking at the bicarbonate being elevated and uh, PCO2 being also high uh, possibly this is a long standing compensated but in this case it is acute on uh, chronic uh, respiratory acidosis possibly type 2 respiratory failure. But what are the re uh, differential diagnoses you can think? 
since it's an elderly female sir uh, any central hyperventilation syndromes osa both peripheral but, but she was like she's not very obese morbidly obese but she's little on the overweight side so osa has to be thought about what are the different types of osas uh, central and peripheral and the peripheral part the soft palate there will be a uh, uh, prolapse of it oh. but in central then basically the respiratory centers there will be brain stem will be uh, okay. hyperventilation the, the oh. stimulation problem will be there so uh, apart from this there will be non obstructive sleep apnea possibly secondary to copd uh, then we'll have to think of heart failure so, any uh, copd is one reason uh, obstructive sleep apnea, sleep apnea various apnea. causes uh. like central or peripheral other causes for type 2 respiratory failure with compensation in an elderly individual other than these two are uh, uh, very common mm. okay then central hyperventilation syndromes okay uh, then um, heart failure itself like uh, nyh chronic heart failure, chronic heart failure okay. itself that can, can cause that can produce some time, some amount of hurt hypothyroidism hmm. hypothyroidism opioid use like opioid chronic use chronic usage of like that that will have like respiratory distress for a long uh, de- depression for a long time not in this patient at least not in this patient okay any neuromuscular uh, weakness okay neuromuscular weak, weakness okay dystrophies. then then you are telling some crepitations are there mm. what else you can think it is not on, it is only a differential diagnosis post seizure yeah no no this patient is having chronic type 2 respiratory failure and crepitations are there on auscultation what other okay. differential diagnosis ILD. 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 ILD can be because ILD is very common in uh, female, female patients, patients. Mm-hmm. and uh, uh, somebody we don't know the history that's why we have to always think about ILD also in this type of patients mm-hmm. so to m- one important uh, differential diagnosis obstructive sleep apnea but this case will be falsely diagnosed as COPD that we have to remember COPD is not very common in female patients at all very very rarely they develop COPD okay but uh, so, obstructive sleep apnea in obese individuals are very common mm-hmm. okay so o- obstructive sleep apnea and ild we have to keep in mind mm-hmm. okay then you have to ask for any joint disease any previous illness like mm-hmm. that you have to ask mm-hmm. ipf can occur what is ipf um idiopathic pulmonary, pulmonary fibrosis, fibrosis. that's that's a type of ild without any peripheral signs okay okay uh, then apart from this because this patient had low saturation and crepitations heart failure was also thought about ecg was taken mm-hmm. ecg just showed sinus rhythm but heart rate was little on a higher note but otherwise there was no obvious stt changes okay. and then apart from this uh, this was the, these were the adjuncts that we used then moving on to the sample history she was a known case of diabetes really you can do an echo if uh, uh, possible on the okay. bedside echo because we don't know whether what is the status of heart okay mm-hmm. So uh, other than that she was a uh, moving on to her background history she was a known case of diabetes mellitus type 2 along with this the ckd history was there okay. and uh, possibly because she's had like past history of respiratory distress too she was diagnosed to have like copd from outside okay. so she was put on derifilin tablet and along with this she had had a uh, history of right hip replacement okay. so uh, moving on to the current medication she was on uh, met uh, glimepiride and metformin combination along mm-hmm. with this derifilin and uh, that's about it like nephrocephorus kidney what is the age of the patient 71 years old so what are the complication of metformin in this type of patients it is nothing related to emergency room metformin we are giving to a patient who is having 71 70 71 years 71 years lactic acidosis can Well, a combination is okay but metformin what what can happen to the patient Myopathy. metformin is one drug which is which is anorexogenic anorexogenic so it can produce anorexia okay so the problem in elderly individuals if you are starting metformin we have to take a history whether the patient is taking adequate food or not okay metformin is ideally given in a patient who is having obesity to avoid food okay but an elderly individual if they are obese still we can give otherwise sometimes it can produce uh, like their life will become more difficult because they'll they'll become anorexic they don't eat food even if they eat food they develop gastritis ga- uh, bloating so many problems can occur but still many patients continue it 
so we have to ask then um, moving to the events that followed like i mentioned two days back she had had a she, she was found lying next to the bed and then she was brought in here with complaints of progressively worsening breathing difficulty and then uh, so so and even suspect pulmonary embolism also uh, could be so. okay so but pulmonary embolism will it produce uh, type 2 respiratory failure type 1 embolism Chronic, chronic permanent. See, a, a female patient who is having chronically bedridden, they can have minute thrombi every day. Then so it will become a chronic uh, type of pulmonary embolism. Okay. There you can get type two respiratory failure and uh, compensation. Okay. okay, so in that type of patients, it's okay. Otherwise, pulmonary embolism as such means it is type one failure. Then, uh, because this patient was drowsy uh, clinically. Uh, Um, there was no pallor, ictus, even clubbing was also not there. So, so I, ILD patients generally have clubbing. Normally, ILD can have, mm-hmm. but ILD can uh, present without, without clubbing, clubbing also. also. So, other than this, uh, there was very minimal pedal edema, but not very profound also. And then, um, systemic examination wise, air entry was bilaterally equal. Patient was tachypneic, increased work of breathing with bi- bronchi was present, but adequate excursions were there. And uh, CVS, uh, no raised JVP, no much features of heart failure as such, and all peripheral pulses were palpable. CNS wise, uh, she was little drowsy, but there was no neurological deficits that were obvious. And GIT, there was nothing significant in this patient. And then, uh, so this was the general physical examination. Mm-hmm. Now, because yeah, the patient hypertension, ischemic heart disease. No, sir, just diabetes. Antiplatelet agents. Just or diabetes. Antipodals. Nothing. Uh, patient. Just disease. diabetes and CKD patient. Yeah. That's all. And considering elderly age and drowsiness with the history of fall, possible fall, uh, CT brain can be also taken to rule out any acute uh, stroke also, and also bleed. Any trivial trauma causing SDH can also be a possibility for her drowsiness. and uh, the next thing that we had to tackle was the abg finding the type 2 respiratory failure part so x ray was taken so which just showed uh, blunting of the right costophrenic ankle but it was only very minimal it wasn't very like pleural effusion massive pleural effusion in a patient who is lying down this patient might, you might have taken a ap view uh. so can you tell blunting of uh, ankle uh, costophrenic ankle is a sign of pleural effusion Really, because in pulmonary edema or pleural effusion, when you are lying down, it spreads over the okay. posterior aspect. So, if you are taking an X-ray, you'll be seeing that ground glass opacity. Okay, throughout the lung field. So, only when you are sitting or standing, that means AP PA view. PA view can get the blunting of angle. Otherwise, blunting of angle is not a sign of pleural effusion. In at least in a AP view X-ray. Ah. Uh. Then apart from this, echo was done. No. Echo showed fair to good LV with no RWMA as such, and uh, ECG, like I mentioned, was fine. And GRV was also it was repeat GRV was also one fifty four milligram per deciliter. And then uh, we invest we evaluated the patient, sent the patient for blood investigations. When we ran a couple of blood investigations, she was found to have hemoglobin of nine point six. CRV was twenty six point seven. What is the importance of that nine point six? Is it important? Not important. Uh, it is a uh, one uh, if it CKD L patients anemia of chronic disease can be. What is the creatinine value? Uh, creatinine is one point five. It is normal. Normal means mm. it's not very low. It is slightly on the or higher side. And anemia low can cause heart failure problems, crepitations, elderly female. Is it a good sign or bad sign in this patient? That is the question. Nine point six for L postmenopausal. This patient is having a chronic hypoxemia. So, what is a normal response? It will go into polycythemia. So, patient ideally, patient should develop a polycythemia. But instead of that, you are seeing a anemia in this patient. So, what will be the magnitude of anemia if there is no COPD? That you have to think. Here you are, you are anticipating polycythemia has to be there. We are not seeing that, but not only that, you are seeing anemia. Mm. So if that part is not there, what will happen to this part? This will go down still. Mm. So that means anemia is significant in this patient. Okay, for a normal female, it is no, it may not be significant. But a patient who is having chronic hypoxemia, 
even a small degree of anemia tell you that there is something big problem maybe she is losing blood from gi tract or whatever it is we have to find out that so anemia in a patient who is having type 2 respiratory failure with compensation it's not a good sign okay uh so other than that the other parameters of thyroid level tests were also done so tsh uh, was 0.37 everything else was normal she is and i am thyroid tablet she is not a known case of oh. hy- hypothyroidism just diabetes and on like outside diagnosed to have copd patient and ckd that's all her comorbidities okay. and then uh, hbv1c was 7.2 but otherwise majorly all the other lab parameters were normal okay. but you want to examine the fundus of this patient diabetes patients retinopathy retinopathy you had to rule out retinopathy yeah. uh, so um, in view of increased work of breathing we put the patient on type 2 respiratory failure we put the patient on bipap so uh, then uh, serial abg showed reduction in the uh, pco2 level and ph was starting to normalize so uh, then the patient was like tapered of abg uh, bipap and 4 is to 1 spacing was put like 4 oh. hours on bipap one no one hour on bipap 4 hours without bipap okay one yeah one is to one four. Is four okay so during night time what happens you have to see mm. day time normally these patients if they are not sleeping nothing would happen if you are suspecting oise mm. but night time when they are sleeping what happens when you are removing bipap that is very important yeah. what all things you observe in uh, uh, see ideally we have to send for a uh, um, sleep it's clinic sleep, yeah. sleep study Polysome. but can can we do it here in icu um, apnea, apnea, apnea so ideally we have to continuously taken. monitor what happens to the saturation what happens to the pulse what happens to the bp any apneic episodes are there mm. so if you are having a, a person to continuously monitor the patient So it's as good as doing a sleep study. Okay, but uh, ICU unfortunately it is not possible. Many times the staff may go for their duty. So sometimes we may not notice. Okay. So if you're suspecting OSC, the gold standard would be a polysomnography. So okay. if that's not, then uh, apnea, hyper apnea so index. So before polysomnography, before doing polysomnography, ideally you have to rule out obstructive airway disease. You have to do PFT. so after pft if there is no problem in pft only we can send it for polysomnography because if the patient is having already copd or asthma now you you are sending for polysomnography night time patient can develop episodes of uh, airway obstruction so ideally that has to be treated uh so polysomnography can be taken so there's something called as a apnea hyperapnea index mm-hmm. wherein we just monitor the patient and see the episodes of uh apnea and hyper uh, hypoapnea episodes that she has and then we divide it by the number of hours that she sleeps so if anything more than 15 accounts to moderate osas okay. so uh but this patient we didn't really send the patient for any polysomnography and all okay. of it but I see, I see still um, she is still in icu she is still in icu and uh, she uh, once her abgs was starting to normalize uh, she was completely taken off bipap during the morning times and she was only put on bipap in the okay. night time but yesterday what happened is when she was put on uh, bipap the the uh, off bipap we tried in the night also but in the morning there was little pco to build up so we had to put the patient back on uh, bipap again so the tapering of bipap is to, is to be like still monitored okay. she's like on and off bipap for now but x-ray wise uh, repeat x-ray is w- mostly clear and even auscultation wise vis as such wasn't really found after the second or third day of her admission here and um, yeah well that's about it so then type 2 respiratory failure evaluation had to be done so if suppose this patient uh, was on ventilator and when you have, we are weaning out from the ventilator you are removing the tube what all precautions you take you yes. treat like a normal person or this is a special situation you are remo- removing the tube from the patient yes. what will happen to the patient patient should have the adequate rate and drive so mm-hmm. anyway like we will have to uh, wean the uh, patient out of the ventilator to probably an nig initially mm-hmm. and then only we can uh, okay the problem in uh, obstructive sleep apnea is there will be airway kinking okay airway will be uh, round shape uh, or possible round shape when you are normal but in this they will it will collapse when they are lying down okay 
so it will be difficult when we remove the tube suddenly patient can again develop uh, respiratory distress like you told uh, always put the patient the on uh, cpap mode then uh, wait for some time then only we can remove other many patients again we may have to reintubate okay that has to be very carefully done mm. Mm. and even while discharging uh, whether we should require home oxygen cpap all okay. of that has to be done what so is the requirement of home oxygen why you need home oxygen in this patient for a, uh, if a, if the patient saturation is not picking up the, mm. like how we treat for copd the mm. long term um, lt ot oxygen therapy what is what is a action of lt ot Mm. pulmonary vascular, vascular, vascular endothelial and damage would occur okay by your uh, hypoxemia hypercarbia and all so that can be arrested okay so it will not progress mm. so that patient will not have pulmonary hypertension that is advantage of home oxygen but uh, this patient require cpap cpap okay cpap is the only treatment mm. okay so the advantage of cpap is that the positive airway pressure will be maintain both in inspiratory and expiratory phase okay. so um, if cpap isn't available bipap can be used but mm. preferable um, cpap uh, what is preferred is a cpap then uh, otherwise her at present her uh, respiratory distress work of breathing has all come down patient is no longer drowsy she is she's able to converse and all okay. but serial abgs persistently show type 2 respiratory failure okay. only So and any role for uh, like this patient will become drowsy in the day time melatonin and it also so sleep uh, mode uh, there uh, melatonin will try to maintain the sleep, sleep cycle. cycle okay so some effort, uh, effect will be there then modern af modern af will modern like daytime sleep okay so so some add on drugs they are not the treatment they can be added to the regime okay the ideal treatment is uh, cpap So any mechanical ventilation, intubation. Sir, um, so suppose the patient is uh, you are planning for an uh, rapid sequence intubation. How will you proceed with straight from the assessment? Uh, sir, the now patient. that the patient has been put on BiPAP, mm. then pre-oxygenation will be given through BiPAP itself. So mm. only after the patient is sedated and just before intubating the patient, we take the patient off BiPAP. Mm. Otherwise, normally we generally take the oxygen mask and we pre-oxygenate. But in these patients, BiPAP itself will be done, mm. and even while intubating, little head and elevation has to be given. It's not completely supine, mm. and proper positioning is important in this patient because let's just say if it's an obstructive sleep apnea and there's a collapse of soft palate, then a uh, uh, shoulder blade that role has to be kept for proper uh, alignment of the airway for easy intubation otherwise visualization will be a problem so What difficult intubation has to be kept yeah so airway two things one is airway assessment and difficult airway assessment yeah. both the things should be done you should be prepared for difficult it intubation cannot intubate cannot ventilate situation yes, also so all the sir. equipment should be readily available and experts should also be by the side mm. so in this age group in such patient what are the things anatomical changes we are expecting one uh, she is little obese also so mm. short neck will be a no. problem did you examine and, the neck uh, short neck will be okay rest. and huh. Edentulous and artificial denture and both upper and lower mm-hmm. completely removable denture. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was having. No, she is like uh, having she has a like she is not edentulous. Edentulous, okay. She is not using any denture. Mm-hmm. Okay. Suppose she is using denture. How will you proceed with? First, remove the denture. But when will you remove? Right before intubation. So scoping. ventilation, you can keep the when the patient is alert and conscious, you can keep the dentures inside. Yeah. So the mask fit See. will be good. Otherwise, if you are removing it, mask fit will not be good. Yeah. So during laryngoscopy and intubation, you can remove yeah. it. Or else, it may be dislodged. Yeah. So full denture may not be abs- going. We can easily remove it. See partial or not to denture that is not fixed. Yeah. Removable denture is we have to be very careful. Yeah. and this age neck the cervical spine mobility neck mobility lemon okay we have to keep in mind anything else he don't tell us then and how to ventilate a patient in he don't tell us by mask mask see we can get better by like uh, uh, lower end of the mask should go beneath the lower lip so that will give a better mask okay next
then proper visualization of the oral cavity before scoping and trying it so we will have an idea on the difficult intubation part also so no, in this part no whenever there you are giving an in uh, pre oxygenation if it is tolerating and improving well it's okay yeah. otherwise in association with the mask we have to do the airway manual mm. so depending upon whether any cervical spine involvement is there or not if it is involved we have to go for jaw, jaw thrust okay. so whenever necessary don't hesitate to use it's airway at the center because a conscious patient we cannot put oropharyngeal airway, airway. nasopharyngeal airway well lubricated will definitely help this sort of patients for better oxygenation don't hesitate mm-hmm. only thing don't cause trauma and make the thing bleeding inside okay, okay. next next um, um obese patient full she has to be taken as a full stomach patient mm. so on by, uh, on by uh, mm. so risk of as gone so piper uh, till how long you will be giving right before until we scope the patient uh, and give the muscle paralysis until then the patient will be on bipap mm. once muscle paralysis has been given like in this case rocuronium was used uh it wasn't used like if at all we have to use it then then after uh giving paralysis is when we take the bipap off and ambute for a while until we scope and so any other one. additional thing nasal of nasal insufflation mm-hmm. we can put a nasal cannula 15 liters of oxygen mm-hmm. and uh, see mm-hmm. the, that is a sleep apneic oxygenation that is called mm-hmm. see the oxygen gradient is very high and the nasal pharynx so this will be get, going down to the lungs also so certain amount of oxygenation will be there okay so in addition to the mask we can in the beginning itself we can use a nasal cannula separately and that can also be connected with 15 liters of oxygen during apnea you remove the mask everything but till the nasal cannula oxygenation will be going on okay you can gain some more time okay anything else you want to tell how is the patient now um we are still trying she is still on and off bipap we are trying to give her attempt trial of of bipap to see if pco2 will fall or not okay. but uh, controlled oxygenation has okay. been given so like what are the uh, advice you give on discharge uh, one would be the usage of cpap in the night okay and uh, lifestyle modification again to lose weight okay um ஒரு <laughs> ஒருபிள்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்ரோல்ட்